Welcome to Enemies from War to Wisdom. Why do we need enemies? From intimate relationships to politics, tribalism, and community, we cannot seem to stop dehumanizing each other. Chronic conflicts in our families, societies, and nations seem inevitable. In this podcast, we analyze human hostilities from the most mundane to the most sophisticated. We apply psychology, psychoanalysis, art, spirituality, and relational theory in conversation about belonging and otherness. Each program will reach for a fresh wisdom that shows us how to step back from creating enemies in our lives. I'm your host, Eleanor Johnson, a videographer and artist with Emma Troop, an experimental theater group in New York City, and I am here with my co-host, Polly Young Eisendratt, who is a psychologist, Jungian analyst, author, and speaker. We approach our ideas each from our own worlds, but always from the spirit and teaching of Buddhism, of which we are lifelong practitioners. In today's podcast, we'll be talking about listening mindfully, getting out of our own head during difficult conversations. Why is it so hard to hear and feel another person's meaning when we are in difficult conversations? Even though we may love the other person, when they speak about something that we believe makes us angry, we may find it impossible to hear anything except our own thoughts. When we feel emotionally threatened as human beings, we protect ourselves and we promote our own points. This is universal. In our current North American cancel culture, often conflicts begin with insults and everyone stops listening. Everyone closes their ears to anything except their own thoughts. But in today's podcast, we're gonna be talking about the second rule of real dialogue called listening mindfully. Listening mindfully teaches us how to open our ears and our minds during emotional pain and animosity in order not to create a hostile, dehumanizing interaction with another person. So maybe we should begin by you saying a little bit about how you define mindfulness, being that mindfulness has now become so popular in the culture. Mm -hmm. And just to, again, focus people from Mm -hmm. your point of view of how you define mindfulness. So first, I think I'll go back to how the Buddha defined it, uh-huh. because he was really the originator, and he right. never used that term. Right, exactly. Yes, and so the... I in, thought that might be the case. <laughs> yeah, and, and the Buddha called it sati, and sati is this quality of recollecting or remembering in this moment that you have some other way to handle things right. other than your automatic way. So your automatic way, believe it or not, is to go through your feelings. A lot of times people have the impression that people are suppressing their feelings. We are all using our feelings all the time, and our feelings affect the way we see things, the way we hear things, the way we think about things, and the way we experience our bodies. So our feelings are the drivers, and it's those drivers that we're trying to essentially take a step back from. So sati means you recollect that you have this method of the Dharma or these principles for living, and you can use those instead of your automatic feelings. And so that's really where it starts. Now, you know, in translating this word sati and trying to bring to Westerners the ideas of this certain kind of awareness, the originators of the English translations of the Buddha's teachings, like the Dhammapada, for example, which is the most popular of of these original teachings of the Buddha, which were recorded, by the way, 454 years after he spoke them, So they were recorded by people who listened to them. We're talking about listening. So they had to open their ears to listen to the Buddha teach and then pass it on to the next generation through oral transmission. So by the time you get to the English translators, you've you've had hundreds of years of people listening. And the English people came up with this idea of mindfulness because they had used this idea of mindful, being mindful. And literally, I think in English, it means paying attention, Mm -hmm. typically like paying careful attention. Be mindful of that, you know, before you set your cup down, pay attention to where you're setting it down. So this, this word is an English word that doesn't quite 
get at what the Buddha was talking about, but it's the word that we use. So what Shinzen has done is taken a lot of the original teachings and put them into a usable framework that you can easily use. And so he's very aware of the way the Buddha taught because he can read and speak Sanskrit. So he knew that language and Pali, which is pretty close to Sanskrit. Shinzen defines mindfulness as the combination of concentration and equanimity, which clarifies perception. So if you concentrate and you have equanimity, your perceptions are clearer. And so let's talk for a moment about those words, concentration. So I'm going to ask you what you would, how would you define concentration? Like if you think about what's it like when you're concentrating? Well, I mean, concentration is a very advanced skill in my mind. And when you are in your subjectivity and you're triggered and your emotions are taking hold, I still find with all of the tools that I have over all of these long years, it's still tricky. I don't find it immediate, you know, in terms of being able to deal with difficult emotions or like we were talking about difficult conversations and all of this. So having whatever tools we have that help us to become more aware or help us stabilize. So concentration is is certainly something that helps us to practice stabilization. So what would you say when you concentrate, when you, what do you think concentration is? Like how, any way that you explain it to yourself so that you know, oh, right now I know I'm concentrating. Like what is it that you would say you look well, there's for? There's alignment when you're, well, from my point of view, not speaking in Buddhist terms or any of that, it, it, concentration, when I'm in concentration, I'm in alignment. But I'm, what does I'm, that allow you to do? Well, it allows me to stay stay present and right. to stay spacious. Focused. Say a word that I use a lot in the face of difficulty or in the face of difficult emotions is being able to stabilize in in a way that I can hold neutrality. I can contain my projections. And sort of that goes beyond concentration. I mean, you're getting into right. equanimity there, but the concentration yeah. part is usually yeah. where people they they have like single mindedness. They yeah. can put their mind. Say if you want to do a crossword puzzle yeah, and you really want to do that crossword puzzle, you yeah. put your mind on it, you can focus, you get through it. If you're not concentrating, then, you know, you look at your phone, you listen to something that's ringing outside, and maybe you never finish the puzzle. And so, you know, even in ordinary life, we need concentration to do our tasks, to finish making a meal, to finish something that we're working on, to read directions, yeah. well, to would, drive the car. Yeah, I mean, you know. pay attention. It means yeah, paying attention pay and attention. focusing and keeping yes. that focus. Yes. Yeah. And now if, you know... I'm drinking a cup of tea, you drink coffee in the morning, that caffeine allows you to focus. It brings that strong sense of, oh, I can focus right now. If you drink too much caffeine, though, what happens? You get jittery. If you try too hard to concentrate, you get contracted and jittery. So it pulls you in. Oh, I need to do this right now. Uh -uh. And if you're drinking caffeine and so on, your concentration may lead towards feeling jittery. So the other side of mindfulness is this relaxation side. That's the equanimity side. So equanimity is this openness, kind of relaxed, open attitude that allows you to tolerate whatever is coming in. You know, I just think of when you're present, when you're present, those qualities are there to the best of your ability. When you're in present time, you know, you're, you're, you're focused, you know, you're open. Well, you know, I mean, for most people, if they're in a rage, they well, may, they may yes. have the impression yes. that they're paying close yes. attention, yes. but they're not relaxed. Right. They know that. They know that. So I that mean, yes. the, the ability to yes. put the concentration together with the equanimity or the relaxation. So those two qualities of single pointed awareness and welcoming openness, open heartedness, that's what equanimity is. It's the balanced, aligned, open heartedness and if you combine the two of paying attention 
with this openness, then your ears and your eyes and your body sensations and all of the perceptions that you have, your taste, your smell, they're all open. And so then if you're paying attention, you should be able to track what's going on. So if someone else is speaking to you, you should be able to track what they're saying because if you have this kind of mindfulness, concentration, equanimity, your perceptions are clear. And one way we test this when we're using real dialogue is that you have to paraphrase back to the other person in a way that attempts to understand the gist of what they're saying, not just parrot, but step in and say, oh, so I'm understanding from your side, from where you are, it's like this. Then you ask, did I get it? It's a practice. Yeah. It's and, a practice. And, that's, yes. and then if you're right, yes, you got it. The other person says, yes, you got it. But very often the other person says, not quite. You didn't quite get it. So there's this as well. So this quality of mindfulness, it's a certain kind of awareness. And it is an awareness that needs to be cultivated. I mean, unfortunately, yes. we don't have a lot of it when we're emotionally right. well, agitated. That's what me because I find that even with all the skills that I have, it's always difficult. I'm far better in my life than I was at other times. But it's just, I don't find that, you know, I just, it's, it's a demanding, uh, it's, de it's demanding. Well, it's, I, I mean, yes. it's, it's it's powerful to have the to have the the concept and have the vision and have the willingness and have the, you know, the hunger, to to be able to to meet those difficult situations where you're you know wide open and alive and not projecting and all of that, and it's a practice. So when we make it, you know, we kind of fall on our sword or keep making mistakes, we we still have we're still mindful enough to go back and continue practicing, not to give up or. Well, I mean, yeah. often what people do instead is that they, they just kind of attack somebody right. or, they, right. or they get out of a relationship right. or yeah. they, they do anything except listen mindfully, exactly. Exactly. you know. And uh, many people can learn to speak for themselves and they can learn the rules of being able to speak subjectively, recognizing that you only remember things inaccurately so you can say what your memory is but you right. don't know the other yes. person's yes. but when it comes to listening it's more that you are tested right on your mindfulness right because if you haven't listened right then you can't say back to the other person this is what i've understood well it's through listening that you really start to hear well, yeah. I mean, you know, let's say that we assume we're hearing all the time, but many times we're not hearing what's going on. We're hearing instead the words we say to ourselves. Right, exactly. And um, lots of people um, know that and find it out when they're, <laughs> when they're doing mindful listening. Right, yes, listening. exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. That was my point. But I mean, these skills are so vitally important right now, given everything that's going on in our culture. And, and, and the other thing I think of, too, when I think of mindfulness, I think of, I think of the realm of unconditionality, that willingness, that willingness mm -hmm. to be able to listen, that willingness to stay open, that willingness to kind of hold yourself together while you're in while you're triggered or while you're upset or even when you're in unknown, you know, where you're feeling inadequate mm -hmm. or terribly vulnerable, kind of meet those conditions with an openness. To me, that is also, you know, being very mindful, having the skill of mindfulness, having the understanding. And certainly, I mean, where I learned that, where I really learned to practice that was through the Buddha. Mm -hmm. It was through the Buddha that, that I that I was able to kind of enter that gateway. Before then, everything was was rich in its concept, but it was not, I wasn't as I wasn't as successful at playing the piano. Let's say that I was able to embody it much more and to be dimensional, where you know feelings, body, mind, all of that was you know all to the best of my ability aligned. So really, the willingness to see another, to to let another be another. I mean, I love the, the metaphoric and imagery of the snow globe that you use, you know, to, to recognize that we're all on our snow globe. And when mm -hmm. it gets shaken up, I mean, we just get lost. Well, we Where pay attention we? to our own snow right, globe and right. nothing else. That's right. Or, or to mm -hmm. then, you know, to when that's happening, to know that somebody else is in their own realm and to let them be in their own realm. 
Well, yeah, I mean, you really can't do, you can't ever make somebody do anything. Right, well, that's Because true, it yes. seems like you can, but you really can't. Right. The thing about mindful listening is that it is at the heart of any approach that would stop polarization right. or end war. And the point here is that when you come to differences, when there is you know, a real contrast between one side and the other, and of course for humans there are many, many countless situations, and really pretty much almost every situation, uh, where we disagree. Right. Because we are each enclosed in this subjective world that we call the snow globe of subjectivity in real dialogue. And it's essentially that we hear and see and feel both the world out there and our own inter inner world subjectively. We don't, there's no world out there that is precise that's out there. It's all of us generating it. And then we have language to say that, well, that, that looks like a tree to me. Well, the other person sees a tree, but we have no idea whether they see the tree the way we do. So that means that we're going to have disagreements and we're going to have some really stark disagreements, especially when it comes to what's the best thing to do? What's the best thing to help our society? What's the best thing to help our family? What's the best thing to help our relationship? We will disagree. And as we go into that disagreement, where our process will break down is typically on the listening side, on the listening side. So it, like the Harvard Negotiation Project, they've done a lot of research on, you know, their, one of their big books is getting to yes. They want to get to a yes in a negotiation, where does it break down? Listening. People do not listen to each other when they are in conflict and when there is a negotiation. What they think they hear from the other person is often not what the other person is saying. And of course, you know, they've, they've got like thousands of hours of audio to prove this, you know, right. like you can actually listen to what the other person actually said, and you find out you did not hear them. So that issue of listening, and we call it listening mindfully. You could call it listening accurately. Sometimes people use the word actively also, actively uh -huh, listening, uh -huh. accurately listening. But the reason I like mindfully listening is that it includes these components of concentration mm -hmm. and equanimity, relaxation, or friendliness. I mean, another word for equanimity is friendliness, that you have a friendly attitude. Or an open-heartedness. An open-heartedness. Yes. And so you can, yeah. you can include everything when you're listening, even the things that you disagree with, even the things the person might be saying that are wrong from your point of view, but you can include them because you've trained your ears to hear what the other person is saying instead of commenting on it in your and mind. And that's also another way of, of exploring generosity and, 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 and not being so selfish in the sense that you're always self-absorbed in your mm -hmm. own storyline mm -hmm. or your own beliefs or, mm -hmm. you know, needing other people to validate all of that, but rather, again, to have that open heartedness where you can allow another person. I mean, it's a generous, it's generous. Right. It, it creates mutuality. It creates reciprocity. It, 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 there's a kindness in it. I mean, when that's there, and maybe that's a, a mindfulness practice, yes. maybe that comes out of spiritual practice, that when that's there, it, you've got, there's an opportunity. Well, that, that's that, gen, you know, when you say generosity, you're, you're really correct. It is the natural, let's say, development of, from a Buddhist perspective, the first paramita. Uh -huh. The very first par paramita is generosity. And that means that your attitude towards being in the world is open. And so if you can cultivate that along with your concentration. Right. Now, let's put ourselves into the picture that we're in right now, which I have to say I'm not listening to these hearings mm -hmm. on the January 6th committee. Yes. Um, but I cannot imagine 
that people are doing a lot of, of uh, mindful listening. Now, it's possible that they've trained themselves well, to really I, take in the other perspective. What I found interesting, I only watched one. My In my community, everybody's involved with it, and so everybody's talking about it. But I, I hadn't watched it. But yesterday I did, with when they were talking about what happened to Vice President Pence. What I found fascinating from almost a professional point of view as well is the way that they were... They were carefully laying down fact through through actuality. In other words, they were just presenting things that were that happened that were shown in video, live voice, written. Everything was documented in a way that, if for any archivist, it's legitimate. Mm-hmm. And and I found that, and I found that there was care on on and with all the different people. Many of the people who are part of that world, who who were part of the Trump world and all of that, who are now stepping back and and uh, and realizing that they made a mistake. And so there were different things that were happening that I was very surprised by. But I thought the care that was there had to do with the fact that everything is so turned upside down and nobody knows what's real anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, yellow Well, did is, anyone ever know what was real? I mean, has there well, been a I time mean, what does when, that mean? Yeah. yeah, because I yeah. think we have this illusion yeah. that we can know really what yeah. is real. It's always, we're always yeah. interpreting it. We're always back and forth. Well, but there was more agreement in yeah. our government to have the two sides present in yes. the past, where the two sides, the two parties, unfortunately, we have only two parties that tends towards opposition, but the two parties, the Democratic and Republican parties, used to have conversations that everyone could listen to, and there was respect on both sides. Well, I thought I, I thought there was a lot of respect. Uh, so you felt that there was. I did, yeah, and I mean, I think that the conditions are different. Were different in the sense that we've never faced this quite in this way before, and also there was a hell of a lot of violence there. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, we were looking at you know. So if you you say, I mean, do values have any meaning anymore? I mean, are they... Well, I mean, I, mean, any, I see, any... I would never get into rhetoric like yeah, that. Yeah. That's not really, a, yeah. you know, because yeah. I would always want to know, you know, what are your values and what are your values? Uh-huh. I assume there's nothing like values. Uh-huh. I assume that each person has embraced something that they regard as the good uh-huh. and something they regard as the truth. Right. And then we have to... Or they to... have a relationship to violence when somebody's life is threatened or when that, you know... From, well, the United States is a war all over the world. I mean, you know, we have been the most warlike, imperialistic society in these recent years. All empires So are. that, well, yeah. so that we, you know, when it comes to violence, I, I think probably... At this point, we probably don't have any peers. The nature of our, let's say, stance is that we have the right to go into other countries and make arrangements. But we don't ever have a modesty in our country to say, how about we go in and ask questions? How about we go in and find out? Well, that what, would have been you know, nice rather than that, having January 6th. That would have been much nicer to uh, have well, that happen you know, I mean, I, threatening I was, people's lives and doing the destruction that they did. So, well, anyway. so, no, I mean, I have to say I don't take that position. I don't know enough. I don't know enough about the people that were there, the conditions that were going on, or what the meanings were. I can say that it was a very, very difficult collision of a whole bunch of things and at the point that that collision take, took place, I, I, st- I had no faith in either political party that is in our country. So at that point, I'd already given up on the truth value that I would put into either party. I think both parties have been very corrupt. So, you know, I stopped listening to the mainstream on it. Mm-hmm. At that point, I was already really, really listening much more to the outliers in the progressive movement as well as some of the outliers in the libertarian movement. Because I, I believe that our country is in terrible crisis in which there are two sides that don't talk to each other. And maybe this was the natural outpouring of that you know, kind of collision. In order, for, in order for mindful listening to take place, both sides have to be speaking to each other. So that's one of the things about real dialogue. Well, it never yeah. takes place. It's harder to do when the bombs are dropping. Well, it never takes place without the two speaking to each other. Right. 
so you know so it, so it would it would not be the case that you would ever have a real dialogue without two sides so you know because it's that's the way it's set up so there's a facilitation of one person speaking and another person listening and then to understand what the speaker has said before you respond it slows down the entirety of communication and many people you know who come into a real dialogue setup are agitated by the slowness of it but once you get into it you realize that unless you slow it down there's no listening well it's an important uh, medicine to have to prevent the the, the to prevent the, the breakdown. I mean, when the, when the breakdown occurs and when the bombs are dropping and when the guns are firing, um, real dialogue is like a little bit abstract. Yeah, you need and to so practice that, well before to be able to have that available to you. There's been almost no practice right. like it um, right. for a very long time. It's like a dream. Well, well, we had civil discourse in the past. We had a civil discourse between the sides that were Represented well, in our in got, our, it, in our it, government. It, it, yeah, yeah. But back to the idea of dialogue. So you know, if you look at what war is, it's it's this conflict of opposites where both sides are armed, and then there's no possibility. Polly, as I'm listening and hearing to the best of my ability. It reminds me also of what we started talking about early on when we talked about enemies. Mm, of course. You know, and, and, and love and hate, mm -hmm. and, and, and all the aspects of self and all and of how that. And we were talking then also how many people in, the, in that period of time when we started talking about enemies were making an enemy right. of the other side, which was typically Trump. I mean, they were right. making an enemy of Trump. Right. They were hating on Trump. And they thought that the hating of Trump was going to bring something better about. And really, hating the hater, hating the other side, can never bring about right. Right. any kind of resolution. Right. And the Buddha taught that. Right. Uh, you know, and the Buddha also said this other very wise thing, that you know, we, humans, must die but many people don't realize that. And if you realize that you will die, it brings an end to quarrels because you recognize you're here temporarily. You're not here to control the place. You are here to be here briefly and to try to understand. And it is really hard for me at times to face the fact that human beings intentionally kill each other in war. That war is where we go in to kill. Uh, other killings take place accidentally. Maybe someone has mental illness, maybe somebody is accidentally this or that, or people kill themselves, that's intentional sometimes. But the war thing is where you go in to kill somebody specifically because you disagree with them. And that seems impossible for yeah. me at this point, but it's true. Yeah. But yeah. I think our, our coming together on the podcast, Polly, and, and all of the, the remarkable work that you've been doing is to try to bring that, that awareness and to educate people to, to understand how important it is to, to learn this so that we can it's have possible. more resources you know, available you know, in our own, to work with our own subjectivity and to just not pull, you know, not reach for the gun. But yeah, to try to not. have that, that equanimity, again, yes, that's, that's concentration, concentration. Equanimity. That's, that's concentration yeah. to be able to, yeah, yeah. And the generosity yeah. not to dehumanize, like don't, right. don't right. create right. an enemy in the person who believes differently than right. you do. That's a human being who has a different belief. Try to listen. Right. If you actually listen, I can guarantee you will have overlap. With that other person, you will see what the other person is seeing. You will hear what the other person is hearing because you will understand something about a subjectivity that's different from yours. And so, you know, it's, it's this matter of being able to recognize that you are limited. You're limited in your time here. You're limited in what you know. And so it's very important to know what the other side is saying. Why is the other side saying that? What is their experience? 
And of course, I, you know, we, we said this at the beginning, Homo sapiens have never been able to accomplish this in all of the time that we've been on Earth. We've been at war, yes, and it's been almost continuous. It's 95 to 96 percent of the time. And I just read now that they've now unearthed all the wars that took place between the Homo sapiens and the Neanderthals. There was a hundred thousand years of war <laughs> between the Homo sapiens and the Neanderthals until the Homo sapiens defeated the Neanderthals. So even when we were doing what you could call, you know, cave life or whatever, I'm not sure how you would put that these days with a politically correct term oh for the right, stone right. age, you know. <laughs> right. But it's it was a long time when people were living in nature without these big weapons. Right, with no social media. No social media. <laughs> no Twitter feed. A <laughs> hundred thousand years of war where they were forcing each other into deep ravines, killing each other in mass killings. And so, the animal you know, nature. we have been in the process. Well, these are the humans. Yes. You know, these well, are the, hominoid, all, no, the no, hominids. No, well, so. I mean, that also brings up another kind of the aspiration of, of, of what it means to, to aspire to be more of a human being than just a mere homo sapien, that you want to be able to, to expand more dimensionally into greater humanness. Well, that's what the spiritual teachers have exactly. all told us. They've said, look, we're not animals. That's right. We are not animals. Right. We're not confined to our biology because we have this consciousness that can see itself, very, very know very itself, very hear very itself. Very so we have a consciousness, consciousness that can hear and see and know itself. It doesn't just hear and see and know. That the dog can do and the cockroach. They can hear and see and know. But our consciousness hears and sees and knows itself so we can stop ourselves from our impulses, from our reactivity, and we can pay attention even though we're reactive. So we have we have this potential to listen mindfully. We have the potential to stop polarization. And we have the potential to end war. It's just that we've never done it. Right. We've never done it. Right. And it's a very, very long history yeah. now of killing and killing and killing. And the killing is based on, essentially, I blame you for my suffering. And so I need to kill you in order to feel safer myself right. Right. and that yes. is uh, the dilemma that humans right. have faced yeah. throughout well, there the time is an on awakening Earth. happening on the planet in terms of more and more um, uh, 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 you know just more understanding of consciousness of becoming conscious again of waking up becoming mindful I mean this is something that is is starting to take hold culturally now and and it gives me hope certainly in terms of our evolution, and especially during a time when everything is in breakdown. So there's a, there's a forcing, there's a fierce tension that we're all living with now in terms of the chaos. Mm -hmm. And then again, the fundamental values that we've based our life on are being shattered. Mm -hmm. you know, so we have to go back in and try to find out what really means something to us and what's, what's helpful in terms of having a much more um, open awareness around wanting to participate in building a peaceful, more sustainable future. Yeah, I mean, I'm afraid the fundamental values have included war. Yes. From the time I was growing yes. up through all of yes. my adult life, there there's always there's who, always yes. been that value yes. of going to war. Yes. And that that has to stop. So yes. that would be a major, yes. major there change. There are more and more people who have a commitment to nonviolence and to doing no harm and to being more accountable and responsible in their lives. And this is something that we have to continually nurture and make more and more available. And I think that's definitely the... the what I feel we're doing when we're sitting together talking about all of this here on this podcast. So, yeah, so, so that I, I, the idea of li listening mindfully, it does mean having the two sides involved. Yes. It's never one-sided, and there's no way you can really listen mindfully if you are not open to the possibility that you're wrong. Or you that have you no are training. wrong. Yes. That, you yes. know, and um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I th I think that training awareness to be able to speak in the way that we we were talking about last time to speak subjectively, right. yes. to speak for yourself, and then listening mindfully. What we're really training 
is modesty and humility and the recognition that you don't know you don't really know without other people you know you have to see the way they see it and then you look at the way you see it and you go back and forth until there's an agreement that you can work together because otherwise there will be this value for war so even now many people that are against weapons that are for nonviolence they still advocate for wars to go in and kill other people's children to to wreck other people's societies because we don't seem to trust that we can sit down with somebody from another part of the world and talk about our differences instead of killing them so you know it's that issue it's a big issue <laughs> that is yeah that's still with us that has been unfortunately a value through my whole life there's been the valuing of war as a way supposedly to make the world safer and that's still what's being said mm -hmm. you know it's no different right now from what I can tell mm -hmm. it's just that our weapons now are more dangerous mm -hmm. uh, I mean we already had the nuclear weapons by the time I was born but we've they've proliferated we have more of them now so you know it's it seems as though human beings have had great difficulty using their words you know we ask the four-year-old to use his words don't hit your brother use your words but then we don't ask ourselves to use our words we send the weapons instead of our words so you know that's where this whole thing becomes very very serious in listening mindfully can we do that when we feel that we disagree completely with the other side but we have words all of us have words we could sit down and listen to the other side instead of sending weapons so you know for me this is a very important time I'm not that optimistic that humans are yet at the point where they recognize they have to use their words I think you know we may have to go further into destruction in order to start using words and listening instead of sending weapons well I think there yeah. are a lot of people on the planet today in all walks of life who are trying to find a way to practice in their daily life and to to be as responsible as they can and to not participate in the darkness of war death and destruction but to just to simplify it they can't come up against nuclear I mean just simplify it my life as an artist is totally devoted to that my international community is devoted to that we're all doing the best we can we're all on a, a fierce edge in a sense but we're very very committed and so you know maybe we're just a small number now but I believe I'm very very hopeful uh, for humanity and for our earth right now and and for those of us who are working diligently to counteract this negativity mm -hmm. and this terrible kind of monster that's out there that's trying to destroy all of life preciousness of human life we can only do what we can do one person at a time I mean these are very very dangerous times but at the same time we have to we have to find a way to um, meet the challenge of our time well you know in a way I would say that it's first recognizing that the monster is in our own hearts we've mm -hmm. talked about this at the beginning That's also. Right, it's, 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 an, it's not yeah, yeah the monster isn't out there yes exactly. it's always in your own the heart enemies that, within us yes. right that you believe that there's someone else who's the monster is the uh, part of the problem the thing about the skill of listening mindfully just going back to this where I do find that I have hope is in the couple relationships mm -hmm. that people are trying to bring about these days with greater equality and reciprocity and trust and so on between them they're having to learn to listen that's right. they're having to learn to listen to the other side and over time I find that individuals feel this tremendous relief when they can hear and accurately listen to what the partner has said even if they don't agree with it so they have developed the skill the partner gives the feedback you got it and you, you have it. that you have that living laboratory right now all the time where you're, all the time yes and, and well, I see is, people change yes, and I yes. see them develop a the skill yeah. and I also see the relief that both people have that they've been seen and heard and felt 
authentically, accurately, as they are expressing it. But this does take slowing down. Yes. It takes learning these yes. skills. It takes the willingness to learn them. And even then, with all of that, it generally takes people at least a half a year of practicing this to get to a point where they have confidence that they can speak together on topics that are difficult. So these are these are educated people coming yes, for like a dialogue PhD. therapy. <laughs> they're coming, they're learning it, they're going through right. the process. And so then to try to translate that to a bigger movement, right. that's why we we're building this app. That's right. And we're trying to take the skills out to the general public. But you know, I think it really it's an uphill battle when yes. you're learning it yes. because you're having to deal with but yourself each you know step by step i mean to the again the degree to which one can have access to some spiritual wisdom mm -hmm. some spiritual practice whatever that is that again that's a beginning you know that that allows you to start seeking out that which will help you more in relation to your own needs yeah yeah, and, and I think you know, and I think that and, yeah. I see Christianity changing. I like the changes I see. I like the fact that that Buddhism has come to the West. I don't, I don't follow contemporary Judaism as much, but I see some changes there too. And what I see happening in all of these domains, the ones that I keep up with, is the recognition that it takes skill to stop creating enemies. That it takes skill. I mean, the Jews in Israel who are working with Palestinians, it takes skill to do that. It takes skill for the Palestinians to work with the Jews. It takes skill for, you know, here in, in our country, it's not as though the religions are oppressing us. It's the political parties. Right. The political parties are where we have to use our skills because we are in this very polarized situation and it takes skill not to become polarized. So, you know, I do see that there are spiritual movements, and I see also the desire to stop creating enemies. On the other hand, I see also the calling out culture, yes. this idea that we have to cancel people, we have to censor people, that somehow we're going to improve things by censoring and canceling the other side. That I also see in large numbers. It's happening a lot. Yes, so that doesn't make me so hopeful yeah, when I know yeah. that the canceling and the censoring is going on. And it's always with the idea that that's going to make us safer right, right, right. or that, you know, it's going to bring about, well, uh, you know, better <laughs> outcomes. It's like, welcome to the unconscious. It's all arising. I mean, it's just amazing how, I mean, even to use the word ignorance, I mean, what does that mean? But I mean, it's just people are clinging to all kinds of things that are just so rooted in the unconscious. Yeah, well, so the, uh, that is, idea yeah. that the monster is out yeah, there right. rather than the monster right. is in That's here right. and I have yeah. to work with our, my own mindfulness. Yeah. That's where my monster That's is. Right. That's it's right. not canceling the other That's side. Right. That's yeah. right. And so, you know, it's those things are going on within our culture and within other societies too, in the sense that there's more, I think, recognition that we create enemies and that we can stop creating. On the other hand, we're also going through this cancel culture, censoring people and creating a, a kind of a social media where there's an enormous amount of control. Well, in control of one side, which is the side that owns the social media, controlling the other side, which is the side that uses the social media. And so, you know, we're, we're also in that, in that framework right now. Having to work That's, with the, you know, the, the 10,000 sorrows and the 10,000 joys, I mean, everything is just all coming together simultaneously. It's a very, very chaotic time and, and we lose coherence. So we lose the ability to co-create together or I'm very, very thankful for, you know, the gift of having a community where we have a shared willingness mm -hmm. to be open and curious and, and kind and generous and, and mindful and all of that to the best of our ability to keep taking actions that we feel can be of help. 
as long as we can continue doing that, I, it just gives me hope. I mean, if you listen to somebody saying exactly what you think already, right. it's very easy to hear that. It's well, kind of, the, it goes through smoothly. Yeah, but and when, the internet is giving us, you know, more access to, you know, alternative voices who are addressing that or speaking to that. It's not in the, the main press, you know, but you have so many people who have that awareness. And as, long as, they, as long as be, they aren't controlled on social media. Yes, also, exactly. You know, and also trying to take, you know, to be as careful as they can in relation to their, you know, their, 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 their public persona. I well, mean, there's more and more awareness of that on a lot of different levels right now. Yes, because it's been so in our face and it's been so harming to so many people. Well, yes. I, I would say that the cancel culture, the censoring, and so on, is the most harmful. Yes. And that, um, you know, again... And it's as, in our universities. I mean, it's in our schools. It's in... Well, yeah, in social media, universities, yes. schools, more educated and privileged yes, people. Yes, yes, they, yes. They engage in it probably more than, mm -hmm. you know, ordinary working people do, because ordinary working people have to get the job done. And so they can't control everything all the time and see if it's doing it, you know, if someone's saying exactly the way they're supposed to talk. So, you know, I, I think that speaking for yourself, subjectively, modestly, listening mindfully, always being interested in what's it like on the other side? What's it like to see things the other way? Right. And that leads to, over time, that leads to, at, at the least, non-hate. Yes. And the non-hate doesn't have to be love. Right. It's uh, it's like equanimity with yes. difference. Yes. And it's openness to let me understand what it's like for you because you're human too. Yes. And all of us in this species, either we learn to live together or we will eliminate our niche our, here. That's our, right. our environment <laughs> that's will be eliminated. Right. and. And I'm not, you know, I'm not entirely sure we know that yet. Yes. I yes. hope that we don't have to go through a whole lot more destruction to stop, but I don't know. I well, don't know. Polly, I think also, you know, as kind of we come to a, a close here, is that, you know, so much of your work is available to the public. Your work with Real Dialogue is broadening out now and, and reaching more and more people. The app will also go into all these different aspects of, of society and, 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 you know, just the, that's very, very exciting. And that's very hopeful for all of us. And, and, and we do have access to your work. The app is teaching the skills. It's yes. teaching speaking for yes. yourself, listening mindfully, yes. and then remaining curious, yes. which is the, the third skill, which we talked about a little bit today right, right. from the point but of view. But your book is there too. So, I mean, people can learn more and more about this and then again, seek out ways to, to have experience with this. Yeah, I mean, I think there's plenty of information online yes, right now. There, there will be more. Yeah. On you know, but you have your book is is about real dialogue. Well, it's I a real just dialogue now, for for well, couples. Well, yes. The, well, there there are two books that are out there. One is Love Between Equals. Right. Love Between Equals is for the couples. Right. And then there's dialogue therapy for couples and real dialogue for opposing sides, which is really a manual for therapists uh -huh, right, or right. professional facilitators right. who want to use these methods. Right. But, but I'm just book. beginning to yes. write a book. It's, yes. it's a, it, That's for it, us. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's, for, it's for you. But it's only got very little written of it, uh -huh. but it's called Polarized the trouble with being right. Yes. And so that's, Very good. that is just beginning and I mm -hmm. hope to have, you know, I hope it will be out in a couple of years. And how will but, people find out about the app? Well, if they're, if they come to my website, okay. youngisadrath.com, yes, yes. and then they, we're, we also have a newsletter which you can sign up for. Uh -huh. And uh, the newsletter will bring you up to date on all the trainings and on the app. And it, it will be teaching the skills to everybody, what's called the end user, which is anybody who wants to learn the skills. And of course, yeah, the yeah, skills yeah. are these things of speaking for yourself, yeah. listening mindfully and remaining curious. Even if you're in an environment where nobody else practices any of these skills, if you practice them, you will feel better about yourself and your relationships. Right. And you will be making a difference. <laughs> I, I, I think so. I think so. I think that what happens is, as you change your way of seeing and hearing things, you're in a different world. That's it's right. not just that you are a different person, 
but you perceive the world differently and it's available to yes. you in a different way. Yes. And you know, what I hope, my biggest hope is that as more and more people humanize each other, then they don't need to dehumanize Putin, Trump, Trump's family, Trump's followers, all of these then will be recognized. Yeah, we'll be out in these the are field our, doing good work. And these are our good colleagues. Care of these are our people. This is <laughs> right. my. This is my species. This right, is my right. team. Taking care and, of the preciousness of human life and each other in our planet. And, and yeah, is, and you know yeah. we can do this. I yes, mean, we can. it's just we can yes. do it, but we have not been willing. Yeah. We haven't in the time that we've been on Earth. It's quite yeah. remarkable. A hundred thousand years between, you know, Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. A hundred thousand years of war. Well, before I, before there was any civilization yeah. as we know it. Well, we are evolving. <laughs> well, <laughs> we are we're, evolving. we're slow. We're slow. Oh, but, you know, it's yes. like we're caught with this whole thing of this self-consciousness, this yeah. sense of ego and control but is also, the very thing that allows us to be yes, aware of our yes. awareness. And so. also to be able to have antidotes that help us to deal with the intense negativity that is that is, you know, hitting us daily. So, you know, this is, this is part of bringing, you know, a much more holistic, holographic, deepening awareness into. Well, I hope, I hope it does that. And yes. so I think that's a good place to stop. Just, that's and... a very hopeful place to stop. <laughs> Polly, thank you so much for all of your extraordinary work. Thank you, Eleanor. Okay. It's wonderful talking to you again. <laughs> okay. The Real Dialogue app is now available. Sign up and download for free at realdialogue.com. Thanks so much for listening, and to continue the conversation, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find past episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and CastBox. Enemies from War to Wisdom is recorded and produced by Chris Coltrane.